Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Can you give him a second to get everything set? You did? Yep. All right. This morning I'd like to talk to you about God's description in Scripture of His true church. We find that here in Revelation chapter 12. If you still have your Bibles open, let's look at this again. Revelation chapter 12. Verse 1 says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. <coughs> this woman here, clothed with the sun, symbolically pure, is a description of God's church. There's another description of another woman further on in Revelation, and Ray talked about that last week and the time he preached before that. This is the woman that's sitting on the scarlet beast, Babylon. I want you to see through Scripture what God's description of His church is. And then the description that He gives through sim symbolism, you're going to have to see whether any church fits those descriptions and if you can find that actual church. So let's look. You do realize that I got nine minutes, right? <laughs> Normally this takes a minimum of 90 minutes to go through, so put your seatbelts on. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just joking. This is probably going to be a two or three parter. Yeah, Thank you. So listen, number one, you need to understand that, again, this chapter and this description is crouched in symbolism. And if we can start to unpack that symbolism, you'll get to see a picture of God's beautiful church. So we go with verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. What does the sun symbolize here? Well, is the sun bright? So if she's clothed with the sun, is she bright? Is she arrayed in bright, pure clothing? Um, if you turn to Malachi, Malachi is going to be the last book of the Old Testament. So it's going to be the book right before Matthew. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2. Chapter 4, verse 2, it says, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow like, and grow fat like stall-fed calves. This Son of Righteousness that's spoken of here in Malachi, who is it? Jesus Christ. So, this woman in Revelation chapter 12, who's clothed with the sun, that sun is this sun of righteousness. This woman is clothed with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? This is what makes her God's true church. Why? Because she knows who her husband is. She knows who the leader is. And she reflects his beauty, his grace, and his character. Amen. Clothed with the sun. What's under her feet? <clears throat> now, the moon is under her feet. She is not traveling on the moon. She's standing on the moon. The moon is the foundation that she's standing on. Is that correct? Now, she's clothed with the sun. Where does the moon get its light from? The sun. The sun. So the moon reflects the light of the sun. Hence, this woman, this church, will also reflect the light of Jesus Christ. Amen. God's true church will be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the truth of Jesus Christ, 
and it will reflect Jesus Christ in the character of its people. Amen? Amen. Is that important? Yes. Do you know why that's important? Because there are a lot of denominations that claim the name of Christ. Is that correct? Yes. And God has a description here that we're going to continue to go through that describes His true church. And this will help you to understand what God is looking for in a church that bears His name. Amen? Amen. So is that important in our day and age? Yes. Is there a lot of deception out there within Christendom? For every denomination, there's a different reading of how the Bible reads. I don't know if that's good English. <laughs> I've got four thoughts in my head at once. Do you understand what I'm saying, though? Okay. What we want to do is we want to look and we want to see through these symbols if, number one, we can see clearly what the Bible is saying, and number two, if there is a church that fulfills what's being written here, contained in Revelation chapter 12. So, going back, this woman, Donald, how do I turn these fans off? <coughs> off, right? Off. Off. I keep blowing my pages. Revelation chapter 12, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. What do you think these twelve stars represent? First of all, before you think about that question, let me ask you another question. This woman, this church, is this just talking about New Testament times, or is this the church of God through all ages? This is the church of God through all ages. These 12 stars that are on her head are symbolism of the 12 patriarchs of Israel. How many children did Jacob have? 12. 12. And each of those 12 became their own tribe, right? Yeah. Those were the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, how many apostles did Jesus have? 12. So, this symbol of these 12 stars represents God's church from the beginning all the way to the second coming of Jesus Christ. God has always had His truth, His people, His church. Amen? We're going to find that clearer as we go on with these texts. Then being, this is uh, verse 2, Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Verse 3. Well, before we get into verse 3. This woman was pregnant. She was going into labor and she needed to give birth. Now, is this a literal woman or is this symbolic? Because I have heard this is talking about Mary giving birth to Jesus. But as we go further on in this chapter, you'll find out that that cannot be true. So this is symbolic as well. This is symbolic about the church. Now, Jesus told Peter when Peter said that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. What did Jesus say after that? Upon this rock, I will what? Build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Was he talking about Peter being the rock? Or was he talking about the truth that Jesus was the Son of the living God? Truth. The truth that Jesus was the Son of the living God. On that truth, the church would be built and the gates of hell itself would not be able to stand against it. This woman who gave birth, gave birth to Jesus. Jesus started the church and that's what being, is being spoken of here. That this woman is the church. Jesus started her. 
It's going to tell you after this interlude with the dragon that Jesus is caught back up to his Father in heaven. And the woman continues on here in the earth. But let's look at this next player in our story. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon. Who is this? This is easy. Satan. Okay, so the fiery red dragon is Satan. Can it be anything else? All right, now, what you need to understand is that it's not just talking about Lucifer himself, but it's talking about the dragon and his power to control people and governments and institutions. Why do I say that? Because what did this dragon have on its head? Well, let's read it. Great fiery red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven diamonds on his heads. And his tail drew how many? A third of the stars of heaven. You've heard us say that Lucifer in his rebellion was able to take a third of the angels of heaven. This is the text that we use to back that up. Okay? So the dragon drew a third of the stars of heaven with him. Verse 4, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them where? The to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Well, let me ask you a question. When Jesus was born, was his life in peril? Yes. Who wanted it? Herod. Herod. What position did Herod hold? He was a king, correct? So what you need to realize and you need to understand, and here's another thing to think about. When Jesus was in the desert and he fasted for 40 days and the devil came to him to tempt him, one of the temptations was that the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him what? All the kingdoms of the earth. All the kingdoms of the earth. And what did the devil say to him? If you bow down to me, I will give these to you. Was he lying there, or did he actually have that power and authority to do that? What you need to realize is that the devil has governments, religious institutions, individual people under his control and sweat. Is that correct? Yes. Hence again, the picture of the dragon with the seven heads, ten crowns on his head. Okay, so when Jesus came forth, his life was in peril by who? Herod, the king. Who controlled Herod? Satan. Satan, right? Jesus' life was spared. He was able to grow, finish his mission. Go back to heaven. What did the devil do? Did he say, okay, I've lost? Please say, I'm going to quit and go back home. He's looking to stay his execution. <laughs> Very well said, right? Very well said. That is exactly true. Verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Now, as I told you before, Revelation is not written chronologically. It will go from here to here to here to here to here to here to here. And you need to understand that. Now, when it comes to this part of the book of Revelation, we know that this woman symbolizes the church. The child that she bore, who does that symbolize? Jesus Christ. The dragon symbolizes Satan, correct? Jesus, was he prophesied to rule all the nations? And was he prophesied to rule those nations with a rod of iron? Yes. When Jesus was resurrected, and after he spent 40 days here with his disciples, where did he go after that? The book of Acts tells you that they gathered together, a cloud came, and he ascended back to his father in that cloud. Right? So this child was caught up to his father in heaven. 
Do you see that that's talking about Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, is, who is this woman? Is this woman the church, as I'm saying? Or is it Mary? Because it's, if you're looking at it, it's only going to be one of the other. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there, how many days? 1260 days, correct? Yep. Now, when Jesus was born, Joseph took Mary and the child where? Egypt. To Egypt. How long did they stay there? Any ideas? He was about four, wasn't he, when he came back? Does the Bible say exactly how old he was? <clears throat> so, that's where you have, if it was Mary, fleeing. But it gives you a specific timeline here, correct? Now, as good historicists in your interpretation of Scripture, and as good Adventists, you know that there is a precedent in Scripture of a year for a day, correct? Yes. Let me ask you a question. When God brought the children of Israel right to the door of the promised land and the spies went in, how many days were they gone for? 40. 40 days. When they came back and they gave their report, out of the 12 spies, one spy from each tribe, how many gave a good report? <laughs> and how many gave a bad report? Ten. Ten. So, the people, did they listen to the two or did they listen to the ten? ten? Because they listened to the ten and they showed great unbelief, their punishment was that God would make them wander around in the desert for how long? Forty days. How long were the spies gone for? Forty days. The Bible says plainly, a year for each day that they were gone and they would wander around in that desert for 40 years. So now, we come to this time period of 1,260 days. A year for a day would make that how long? Can't be Mary because she didn't live that long. Right? So, a 1,260 year time period, this woman would flee into the wilderness. If the woman is the church and she's fleeing into the wilderness, what does the wilderness symbolize? Symbolizes the church going underground, not being able to practice out in the open, not being able to be organized out in the open, correct? Why? Because she is fleeing persecution. She is fleeing the dragon. This is a way mark to show an identifying mark of God's true church. That if you, hold on for a minute, right? If you get the starting point of this and you get the ending point, God's church wouldn't be an organized, open church during that time period. Why? Because his people were fleeing from the wrath of the dragon. Even right. history calls it the dark ages. Now, well, I can't believe I covered all that in six minutes. <laughs> There is so much packed here in this one chapter that I could take days and days to uncover it. This 1260 day or year time period, is this the first time that it's mentioned in the book of Revelation? No. It's mentioned at least three or four times. And it's talking about the same event. Now, as I said, Revelation is not written in chronological order because I'm going to show you where else it's written. And you're going to go ahead, and you're going to go back, and you're going to go back to chapter 12. Okay? But it's talking about this same time period. Verse 6, Then the woman fled into wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there 1,000 260 days. Now the scene switches again. You gotta love this. The scene switches so many times in this chapter. 
The first scene is the woman. The next scene is the child being born. The next scene is this great red dragon. The next scene is the child being caught up to heaven. The next scene is there's war in heaven. When did this war in heaven take place? Earth. Before the earth. Do you understand why I'm telling you that this book is not written in chronological order? <laughs> yeah. Do you see that? You have to establish this because there's three main views of prophetic interpretation. That is historical, preterist, and futurist. And the one that most churches today hold to is the futurist version of interpretation. Adventists have, from when they started, this has changed. But historically, we are historicists in our interpretation of uh, prophecy and scripture. Now, our general conference president, this is his second term, keeps bringing us out and making sure that our schools and our leaders and our pastors continue in this line of interpretation. Because it is, it's not perfect. Understand that. Why? Because we are following. It's not perfect. But out of the three, it makes the most sense and it is the best. Because it will give you a much clearer understanding of what God has done in the past, what He's doing in the present, and what He will do in the future. And you don't have to do spiritual gymnastics to make it work. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon with his angels fought. Verse 8, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Can you imagine? Can you imagine having that much pride that you would actually start a war with God in his own home? Thinking that you're going to actually win? What that tells me, and this is just what I've come to the conclusion of, is there are things that, that Lucifer knew about God that allow him to continue forward with this that we don't know or understand. And it has to do with God's love and his patience, right? This open rebellion broke out in political argument. <laughs> you see, there's the, the, it, it's, it's really core as rebellion. That's how I see it. We don't need you, God, to be holy. The people are already holy. That was the argument. And that was Lucifer's argument, yes. correct? Yes. But I want you to see from these verses is that there was war in heaven. That some type of open rebellion took place there. And what this has to do with is the same thing that is causing all the rebellion today and it all centers around worship between true and false worship. Let me ask you a question. Is the God you serve precise in what He tells us of how we are to approach Him? Amen. Does He have the right to be? Amen. Has He always been precise in how we are to approach Him? Amen. See, there's another word that I want to use, and I use it in my Sabbath school class, but I forgot it right now. <laughs> so that word's going to have to do. <clears throat> Has God laid out clearly how we as sinful human beings are to approach Him? Yes. Has God laid out clearly the plan of salvation that can take sinful men and reunite them with a holy God? When Cain and Abel brought their offerings to God, did they both clearly know what God's rules were? Absolutely. And did God accept one and reject the other? Yes. Why did he reject Cain and accept Abel? Hebrews tells us that Abel came to him in faith. And his offering was an offering of faith. Why? Because it was exactly how God had instructed. Amen. Do we have the right in 2017 to approach God on our terms? Absolutely not. Does that not bring God down to our level? 
Are we not worshiping a God created in our image if we do that? This, brothers and sisters, is the rebellion. This is the great controversy. This is what started in heaven and is continuing here on earth. True worship. What is true worship? You need to understand that because there's a lot of things that they call worship. But the Bible says that we are to approach God and worship Him in the beauty of what? Holiness. Holiness. Amen. Thank you, sister. The beauty of holiness. So who are in heaven? Michael fought. The dragon fought. The dragon lost. The dragon got kicked out. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to where? Yeah. To the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. How many angels did Lucifer bring with him in his deception? Third. A third. The book of Daniel tells us that when he was in vision, he saw 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Have you ever done that on a calculator? <laughs> I think your calculator come up, comes up in error. Just take a third of that number. Those are the demons that you have now on this earth. Is there a lot of them? Yes. Do you understand why evil is so prevalent and so wicked here on this planet? So listen, this war in heaven, they're cast down to this earth. When he came to this earth, he said to himself, if I can get... The man, this will be mine. I will be its rightful ruler if I can get the man. And how did he get the man? Through the woman. Through the woman. Right? How did he get the woman? Deception. By deception. And how does he get us today? The same way, by deception. And what Adam lost, the devil gained. And Jesus Christ came to take it back again. Amen. The book of Job tells you that all the sons of God gathered at God's throne. And God looking out, seeing all of them, sees the devil. And what does he say to them? <laughs> Where did you come from? What the devil said? From going to and fro on the earth. Was the devil allowed to be there? Yes, because if he wasn't, he wouldn't be there. Hmm. Who was supposed to be there? Adam. Adam. Because Adam was given dominion. And Adam lost that dominion. And the devil usurped it. He stole it. Christ came to take that dominion back. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. The devil has been at war with God's church from the fall of Adam and Eve. And he'll be at war all the way to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, in the book of Genesis, when God gets all these players together, the man, the woman, the serpent, what does he tell the woman? He gives her a promise. And he gives her the first inkling of the plan of salvation. The first prophecy of the Christ who would come. He said that she will bear a man-child. And he will bruise the serpent's head. And the servant will what? Bruise his heel. And the devil has been waiting for that man child to come all the way to the birth of Christ. Christ came, Christ was victorious, and the devil did not give up. Why, Ray? You said it because he's trying to prolong his time. Because in the end, he will be destroyed. Amen. The question is, is how long will it take for us to get to the end? A lot longer than I have thought. A lot longer than it needs to be. Amen. Right? Yes. What we want you to understand is that the Bible says we can hasten the coming of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. How do I, be me, do that? And it's not me. It's Christ living in me. 
It's me submitting to him and having that faith that God was looking for in Israel when he brought them to the door of the promised land. All they had to do was believe and accept and follow God. Did God ever want them to raise up their battle arms to conquer Canaan? Wasn't God going to do it for them? 